What do you guys think? Should we get started? I think so. Okay. Awesome. So let's do this. Bonjour, all. Welcome, Marnie and Dinah Nakaz. Gawain and Noro Demesin. Um, Bujwik Wading, Bujwik Widong, and Dunjaba. Ona Gamin Singenda. Miigwech, meet you. So happy that you all could join us today. Um, for some of you, you're, you're reaching us all the way across Indian country. This is fabulous. We are so very appreciative you could do so, as well as that we have the technology that enables us to do this. So my name is Marnie Keske. I am the Cultural Preservation Specialist with the 1854 Treaty Authority. For those of you that might not be familiar with our organization, we are an intertribal natural resource management agency working for both the Boys Fort Band of Chippewa and the Grand Portage Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. We are tasked with two things uh, to protect as well as to implement the off-reservation treaty rights harvest um, on those lands that were ceded to the United States government in the year of 1854. That's all of present day Northeastern Minnesota. And um, my partner in crime today, Keisha Stoll, she's the marketing coordinator, Bougie Keisha, with the St. Louis County Historical Society. For those audience members that may be a little more familiar with 1854, but not so much the history people, can you fill us in? Absolutely. We were started in 1922, uh, and our, our mission really is to collect, preserve, and present the history of all of St. Louis County. Uh, so we're, any information we can have, photos, paperwork, archives, uh, we're getting all that in and then preserving it so that uh, historians and scholars and anybody who's interested will be able to always access and have that history. Fabulous. Miigwech. So in terms of how we're going to handle our time this evening, um, when we finish with this brief intro, we will welcome Marianne Gagne and Sarah Deschamps from the Grand Portage community to share a little about their experiences with moose and growing up moose country. Um, then we're going to hand it over to Morgan Swingin. She is 1854 Treaty Authority's wildlife biologist. Bonjour, Morgan. Um, she'll give us some background on moose, uh, kind of the current state in their, in their population zone here in Minnesota, and then describe some of 1854's moose monitoring objectives and uh, within that monitoring program. We'll finish up with a little Q&A session and due to the high interest and turnout today, um, it was recommended we host this program in a, in a webinar format. It's kind of like the email I dropped you guys earlier. Therefore, the participants are not able to uh, verbally speak. Uh, your audio is actually gonna be cut off. So we ask that you provide your questions to us via typing them in the chat. And I will do my best to moderate at the end to make sure that we get those questions forwarded to the right folks. <clears throat> um, be sure to stick around. I don't know if anybody heard this before Keisha mentioned it, but be sure to stick around for the whole hour. Keisha has some great giveaway prizes that will be raffled off at the end. She'll be pulling those names from the registration forms, but you must be present to win. So again, Keisha asked everybody, when you're logging in with your name on the screen here, if you can put your first and your last name, that'll help us recognize who you are and get your prize to you if you are a prize winner. <clears throat> uh, if you really enjoyed today's gathering, please consider tuning in for the second of the four part series. Next week, we dive into climate change. And uh, tomorrow, expect a follow up email with a short evaluation. Uh, for those teachers, a Kahoot educational resource will al also be included. Uh, likewise, for those of you that requested continuing education credits, expect those forms in your mailbox as well or inbox. Uh, I am so incredibly excited and happy um, to have Marianne Gagne here tonight, as well as her niece, Sarah Deschamps. I first met Marianne when she was working as Grand Portage, uh, the Grand Portage Band's Tribal Historic Preservation Officer and Museum Director. So whenever I was up driving around doing programs on the reservation, I'd swing by and jaw jack a little bit, catch up, get the latest stories. And she always had the, the best stories. She always had her thumb on the pulse of what was going on. And I remember she shared with me one time about her moose hunt in 1998. And it was, 
it was thrilling. I, I remember having goosebumps all over my body just listening to this story. Marianne, she's a woman with small stature, but she's tough. And those moves <laughs> being like maybe 10 times her size. I don't know if she's going to share that story with us today, but um, certainly that story as well as um, some of the other things I've learned from your community members and, and Sarah too, being avid harvester, um, it really kind of drove home my understanding of the cultural significance of moose, not only to this area, but to the Grand Portage community. So um, miigwech everybody. Marianne, Sarah, do you guys want to take it over? Sure, um, like Mike said, I'm Sarah Desha. I'm from Grand Portage. I've lived here my whole life. Um, I grew up moose hunting and um, I learned from my dad and my mom were moose hunting. And I think um, it's pretty unusual that when I was growing up, you know, you'd wake up, I'd wake up and I'd be in the back of the truck. That's how I'd wake up every morning in the fall looking for moose. And um, I think a lot of that comes from my dad's side of the family. And Marianne knows my grandpa Norman was a moose hunter and he, he was great at teaching his kids how to do that. And Marianne, one of my favorite stories is when she talks about um, her first moose. I'm Marianne Ganya. I am lived, born and raised here. I only left, left a couple of years to go to school. Um, <coughs> I, before I get into my first moose story, I need to um, tell you a little bit about my dad, uh, Norman Deshaun. Um, he, he, he was a great moose hunter. And one winter, um, he shot a moose out in the woods, of course. Um, and he come home and he said, Marianna, Norman, you get ready. You're going with us to help us haul it out of the woods. And I said, well, okay, what, what do we have to do? Well, you just got to come and help. So we got dressed and away we went. I think Norman was 13 and I was 14. So we got up there and my dad had quartered the, the moose in, in, the, in the woods. So it was our duty to drag the quarters out of the woods on top of the snow into the car or into his truck he had. Um, we ate moose a lot. Um, and we shared, my dad shared a lot of it. If he got, if he shot two moose, he would sh share it with other members of the community. He always gave it away, majority of it away. And we lived on moose meat all our lives. And uh, it, it's great. My first, I never hunted on the reservation. Um, I only hunted in the 1854 territory. And in 1998, my brother asked me, he said, do you wanna go moose hunting? And I said, well, I have never been moose hunting before, but I had a, ra a, a rifle that, that I hunted deer with. And I said, yeah, I'll go. So him and I got on a ticket and we put my, my mom's name on there and we got drawn. So he comes and picks me up about five o'clock in the morning and it's dark and kind of chilly morning. So we head out and when we leave, we'd go across the Ringo Road in order to get over by Arrowhead where we hunted. Um, uh, so, cause then it would get light, it'd be light out. So that first morning we went out, um, we went, we went up Arrowhead and then we went over to by the Shoe Lake area. And there was this old road that was off to the right there. And he said, uh, there's a big clearing in there. He said, uh, let's go back in there and, and um, wait until, you know, it's completely daylight. So we went back there and we were sitting there having coffee and, and uh, all of a sudden a, a big uh, cow came walking in front of us. That's that, at that time you could shoot a, a bull or a cow. Um, so then I, I got, was getting my gun ready and he said, wait, he said, wait, wait, wait. He said, there's gonna be a bull, big bull coming out. So all of a sudden a great big bull stood up and start walking behind that cow. So I get out of the truck almost dumping my coffee all over the place. And, and uh, so I stand there and I said, well, you gotta back me up. You gotta get ready to shoot too. So put my gun up 
and I was aiming and he said, take your time, take your time. So I shot and I didn't hear nothing. I said, well, did I get it? And he said, well, didn't you hear it? He said, it hit the ground so hard. But what had happened, my scope came up and hit me between the eyes. My glasses split in half and ending up with two black eyes from that, from that moose. But I didn't care, I shot the moose. That was my very first moose. And we shot that within an hour of the time limit that we were um, supposed, when the season opened, and that was the first day. Well, that same year, they had a drawing for rifles. So if you shot a, 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 a bull, you got in that drawing. So we sent my name in and we um, um, didn't expect anything. Well, then I got a call and said that I had won the rifle too. So that was my first, um, first hunting experience, first moose. And then I happened to win that rifle. So that was a, a really good year. And then um, I told him, I said, well, I said, now what do we do? <coughs> he said, well, we have to, we have to gut it out here. So we, we did all that. And then I thought, well, I said, now how are we gonna get it in? Well, it just so happened that um, he said, we'll go back home and get a trailer. But just so happened another, um, 1854 party came along and they helped us and, and use their trailer and put it on the trailer and, and we hauled it in. And it's fun moose hunting. And it's, it's so nice to be out, out in the, the fall air and everything. And, um, but once that moose is down, then you have uh, tons, of, tons of work to do. Um, so we brought it home and we hung it for, I think, two days, something like that. And then we, we all got together and, and, um, and it was just him and I. So we asked a couple other people to help us and we scun it. And then we said, well, we'll pick a day when we can uh, cut it and wrap it and everything. So we uh, brought it to my house, brought that whole moose into my house, quartered. And we started butchering it and then we were wrapping it and we had the meat grinder going in the mud room to make hemp burger. And so you cleaned it on your kitchen table, right? Yes. Yeah. And then in the meantime, I'm over there cooking steaks on the, on the gas stove so everybody could have some a taste of that, um, uh, the moose we shot. So that, that was a pretty exciting time for me. And it was a nice, it was a nice big, um, Big bull, I was pretty proud of that, that bull. Um, we got uh, 1854 permits every other year after that. And every time we went out, we had, we shot a moose, we got our moose. Um, then later on, we added um, my granddaughter, Jenna Olson and my friend, uh, Dana Logan. And my brother, Alan was the one that was, took us he had more patience with us women than I think any other guy that I know of. And then the last time I hunted, um, we started to hunt and then he had two strokes so that my hunting, moose hunting days were over. So I don't moose hunt anymore. So every once in a while, a um, couple guys will bring, bring over some, you know, steaks or hamburger or something. So that's, that was nice. What else? Your pictures. Well, my pictures. I mean, you want to see my pictures? <laughs> sure, I'll share them right now. Oh, Marnie, you have to let me share my screen since it's disabled. Then one time we were out there, we shot we shot a moose. It was on, on another side road because you get into the clearings. That's the majority where the moose are hanging out. And we got it at and. Um, my brother put a note in the, the moose's mouth. And we said, uh, that's, that's me and my brother, Alan, there. And that's the first moose I shot. Um, and he put that note in, in his mouth. And I said, we're looking at him. I said, what did you write on that note? He said, I put, this is my moose. Leave it alone, Alan Disha. <laughs> I said, how come you're doing that? That's what dad used to do all the time when he'd shoot a moose. <laughs>
that's the trailer we could finally got it on there it took a while to get it on there because we had to get another truck and then pull it on there um because i didn't own a truck ellen didn't own a truck so we always used a trailer see that was the party that came along and mm -hmm. and helped us uh get it out of the woods Got a lot of meat out of that one and shared it, you know, with the, that's the rack. The rack was pretty big. Is that at my house? That's at your house. Your dad let us use the, the pulley thing. Even if we didn't get a moose, there was always a moose hanging in the yard. <laughs> yeah. Someone brought a moose over. Right. <laughs> Let's see what else can we talk about i don't know there was so there was so much fun out there hunting every time we went um um oh then one time we um there was me and um Al, my brother and, and jenna and, and dana and we shot a moose on a day when it was 70 degrees and that's the hardest i think i ever worked on getting the moose out getting it skinned and getting it into a cooler area. We had to do that all, of, all in an afternoon and then we quartered it and we, we had to put the quarters in my basement um, because it was cooler down there and uh, we packed ice bags around the moose to keep it cool because it was just too warm to put anywhere else. And there wasn't any freezer space anywhere. So. You have to look at all the conditions when you when you when you're moose hunting. Um, it seems like we always shot a moose when it was raining or sleeting or or something, but we always managed to get one. You're on. <laughs> I can't follow that. No way. Yes, you can. <laughs> I got goosebumps again, though. I did. It's amazing, especially those photos. Oh. It's uh, it's 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 a it's it's a thrill uh, when you shoot a moose, but then it, it's also you got to put the tobacco down and thank the creator, and then you got to you know, and then then all the hard work begins. And is that the biggest moose you've ever shot? Yeah. Yeah. Well, see, my brother would, he wouldn't shoot unless uh, one of the girls missed. He always wanted the girls to uh, shoot a moose. And then one time, oh, it was a long ways away. Him and Dana, Dana said, uh, Alan, you got to put your gun up too. So we'll shoot. If I miss, you shoot. Well, it had so happened that they both shot at the same time. Well, the moose went down, but we don't know who shot the moose. So Alan said, well, Dana, you shot it. <laughs> He'd probably only claim it if it was a good shot. Well, exactly. <laughs> That's awesome. But moose, is, moose meat is so good. There's so many ways you can fix it and, and uh, I know a, a lot of people have a har um, harvest in shops now, but but we always used to do it at home. In a cold garage or kitchen table. Yeah, kitchen table and oh, then one time we we're um, well, I can tell you who it is. <laughs> Captain Don was a was a, he runs the Sea Hunter Two here. He, he used to be a butcher. Well, he said, well, if you need any help with that moose, he said, I'll be glad to help you. And I said, so we said, okay, we'll take you up on that offer. We'll give you um, some burger or whatever. No, no, I don't need anything. So he came up and we give him the hind quarter, which is huge. That's a lot of meat on a hind quarter. Well, he started to butcher and he was going so fast, we couldn't barely keep up with him with the wrapping. And he didn't quit. We'd say, well, do you want a pop or coffee or something? Nope. He, he cut that hind quarter until he was done with it. And I'd never seen anybody 
cut up a hind quarter that fast and that good. I mean, there wasn't a piece of meat left on any of that, that bone. <laughs> but exciting times, family times, good times. That's so great. Thank you so much for sharing that. Sure. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> I don't know. Do you, do you feel like you have anything more to say? Or should we hand it over to Morgan? I think we're good. I Okay. If you, I don't know, if you guys want to stop and if it reminds you of something you want to cut Morgan off. <laughs> so go, yeah, go for it. <laughs> we'll send a message in the chat if we have anything else. Yeah, you can send them. I'll send a message <laughs> in the chat. <laughs> Jimmy Gwitch. Sounds good. Should Gwitch. I take over? Sure. Okay, let me get my, I've got a PowerPoint here. Let's see. Can y'all see that okay? Yes? Okay, perfect. Get my little pointer here. I can point to stuff. Okay. Well, yeah, so thank you, Marianne and Sarah. That was great. Um, it's always great to have a little cultural connection to some of the more sciencey stuff that um, we do. Um, but yeah, as Marnie said, I'm Morgan Swain. I'm the wildlife biologist at the 1854 Treaty Authority. And our wildlife program here is focused on those species that are of cultural importance to our bands. And like you just heard, um, moose are definitely one of those species. And in addition to implementing the moose hunt for the Grand Portage and Boys Fort bands, um, we're involved in a variety of research and monitoring projects aimed at maintaining a healthy moose population in the ceded territory. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, guessing we sort of have a varied audience here. So I'm going to go first a little bit into the biology of moose um, and then the moose population in Minnesota and threats to it. And then I'll talk about some of the work that we do here. Um, so first of all, um, moose are the largest member of the deer family. So they're closely related to white-tailed deer, elk, caribou. Um, as Marianne said, adult male moose are called bulls and they grow antlers every year, which are shed or fall off in the winter. And then female moose are called cows and cows give birth once a year, usually in May after about an eight month gestation period. Um, a young moose is called a calf, and most cows give birth to one calf every year, although twins aren't uncommon. Um, calves usually stay with their mother until they're about one year old, and the cow is preparing to give birth to an another calf the next spring. Um, moose are a cold adapted species, so they have really large bodies and thick fur, so they're really well adapted to cold environments. And they have long legs, which make it easier for them to move through deep snow. Although it's still a lot of work moving through snow, um, it's easier for them than for something like a deer. And all that work means that they can get heat stressed really easily. Um, so during the summer, if it gets above like 60 degrees or in the winter, if it's above like 20 degrees, they can get heat stressed. Um, in the summer, they try to sort of stay in shady conifer areas or go in the water to kind of cool off. Um, moose are herbivores, so they eat plants, of course. Um, since they're so big, they need to eat a really large volume of plants. Um, a big bull moose can eat up to 50 pounds of food each day in the summer. And during the summer, they're eating things like leaves of terrestrial plants, and then they also eat aquatic plants. And in the wintertime, they transition to eating the small twigs um, from terrestrial plants. And they prefer kind of young plants that are shorter and easier to reach and that have like a higher nutritional content than like a large mature tree would. And some of the plants that they prefer include things like mountain maple, pin cherry, uh, paper birch, hazel, aspen, and then some aquatic plants like the milfoils, bladderwort, pondweed, stuff like that. Um, moose are really good swimmers. They can actually dive underwater for up to a minute um, to eat submerged plants. And those aquatic plants provide um, the sodium that they need in their diet. Um, so in Minnesota, back in the 1980s, uh, moose were concentrated into two separate populations that you can see here. Um, this map shows 
um, the areas of highest moose density in this dark gray. So we sort of had a concentration in Northwest Minnesota and a separate one in Northeastern Minnesota. And those two populations were um, monitored separately by the DNR and for each population, uh, the number of moose was estimated annually from aerial surveys. So this graph shows those population estimates for the Northwestern population. And as you can see, um, starting in the early 1990s, um, biologists began to see a really rapid decline in the number of moose estimated to be in this Northwestern population. And the cause of this decline wasn't really completely understood, um, but they started finding a lot of moose that were infected with a parasite called brainworm, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. And by 2010, which isn't part of this graph, um, there are estimated to be less than 100 moose left in the Northwestern Minnesota population. So by 2010, the range of moose had sort of shifted. So we just had this primary moose range in Northeastern Min Minnesota still, and this lighter gray area is where moose still existed, but just at relatively low densities. And so aerial surveys of this northeastern population continued. And then starting in about 2009, biologists started to see a sharp decline in the northeastern population, sort of echoing what had happened in northwestern Minnesota. And the population estimates fell by about half from nearly 9,000 moose estimated in 2006 to just over 4,000 moose in 2012. And this again raised concerns um, and prompted the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources to initiate a large scale study of moose in northeastern Minnesota to try and determine what was causing this population decline. So they started a study um, and they radio collared 173 moose in northeastern Minnesota. And they used those collars to determine uh, when a moose died, they would go in and try to figure out what it had died from. And this study provided a lot of information on the causes of direct mortality to moose here up in northeastern Minnesota. So over the four years of the DNR study, they had 57 moose mortalities that they recorded. And this pie chart shows the major causes of mortality that they determined. And the three main causes were parasitic infections, wolf predation, and bacterial infections. And this is a pretty high rate of mortality due to parasites. So when we break that down further, um, we can see there were actually 17 moose that died of parasitic infections. And most of those deaths were caused by three main parasites, brainworm, winter ticks, and liver flukes. So first I'm gonna talk a little bit more about these parasites, and then I'll talk some more about the other threats to moose, just to give some background to some of the research and monitoring projects that we do. So first of all, brainworm. Um, this probably looks a little complicated, but it's important to understand the life cycle of the brainworm parasites. Um, so the white-tailed deer is actually the primary host of the brainworm parasite. Uh, the adult brainworms live on the brain covering um, in an adult deer, and they reproduce there and their larvae migrate through the deer's body and they eventually reach the digestive tract and leave the deer's body in their feces. And then this parasite actually needs a secondary host to continue their life cycle. And that secondary host is a terrestrial snail or a slug. And this snail or slug becomes infected when they come into contact with the deer feces on the ground. And then the brainworm larvae transform into its second life stage within the snail or slug. And then other deer are infected when they accidentally eat these snails or slugs, um, which we think they do just sort of eating vegetation that the snails or slugs might be on. And then the larvae migrate into the deer's brain and become adults and this cycle starts again. And it might sound invasive, but deer actually don't really show any ill effects from brainworm infection, likely because deer and this brainworm parasite co-evolved. Um, but when a moose becomes infected with brainworm by eating one of these infected snails or slugs, um, they show a really strong immune response and they can exhibit symptoms such as lameness in the hindquarters, meaning they're not really able to walk, um, abnormal head positioning, like you can see in this photo. They might sort of walk in circles. And once infected, um, most moose die. 
And moose are actually what's called a dead end host for the brain worm parasite, which means the adult worms can't reproduce in a moose. And so uh, an infected moose can't infect other moose, which just means moose can only become infected in areas where there are also white-tailed deer. So then liver fluke is our next major parasite. Um, this is actually a large flatworm that insists in an animal's liver, and that's why it's called a liver fluke. Um, this is actually a picture of a liver fluke down here. They're about two inches long. Um, and then this is the life cycle of the liver fluke, and it's pretty similar um, to that of the brain worm. So white-tailed deer are, again, the primary host of a liver fluke. The life cycle is similar. Um, they also have an intermediate host, um, which in this case is an aquatic snail. Um, and the larval stage actually emerges from the snails and insists on vegetation. And then when an animal eats that vegetation, they can become infected. And this photo in the upper right actually shows a cross section of a deer liver. So you can see this is actually the cyst that's formed by this parasite. And one of these cysts can have more than one fluke inside and a single animal can have multiple flukes in their liver. And trauma to the liver caused by these flukes can actually cause mortality in moose as we saw from the DNR study, if the infection is severe enough. Um, but again, um, liver fluke infection doesn't seem to cause problems in white-tailed deer. And just like brain worm, moose are dead end hosts for liver fluke. So the flukes can't reproduce in a moose, meaning moose can only become infected in areas where there are also white-tailed deer. And then the last major parasite is winter ticks. So winter ticks are a species of tick that only parasitize moose and other deer-like animals. Um, winter ticks lay their eggs in the leaf litter in the spring. And when the eggs hatch in the fall, the larvae climb up the vegetation and try to attach themselves to a moose or a deer. And then the larvae, once attached, transforms into a nymph, which is just an intermediate life stage, and eventually into an adult tick, all on an individual moose or deer. And the adult female ticks take a large blood meal in the spring before they drop off the moose to lay their eggs on the ground again. So this picture shows an adult female tick and an engorged adult female tick. Um, and then this picture down here shows actually the back of a moose's ear covered in ticks. Um, so moose aren't especially good at grooming off those little tick nymphs that attach themselves in the fall. And in a bad tick year, one moose can have over 100,000 winter ticks on it in a season. And the combined effects of all those little tiny blood meals taken by the ticks can actually cause the loss of liters of a moose's blood, which can cause anemia, which is just when you don't have enough red blood cells to carry oxygen around your body and you kind of get tired. Um, Attempts by moose to groom off the adult ticks takes energy and also often results in the loss of hair. And you can see that in these other pictures, um, these patches of hair that are missing is where the moose was attempting to rub some of these ticks off. Um, and that hair loss can make them more susceptible to hypothermia. So a combination of the anemia, um, the energy needed for grooming and hypothermia from hair loss can result in death for moose, um, especially in calves, which have a lower um, blood volume than adults do. Okay, so enough about parasites. Um, so I'm gonna go back and talk about one of the other major direct threats to moose, which is predation. Um, we all know, I think, that wolves are the main predators of adult moose, as we saw in the DNR study. Um, however, it is sort of a complex relationship. Um, deer play a role, so where there are more deer, um, it can actually support more wolves, but deer can also reduce the predation pressure on moose because they're sort of an alternate source of prey for wolves. So it's sort of a complex um, predation relationship. Um, Predation on moose calves is also an issue, and we know wolves can kill moose calves. And other research at Grand Portage and other areas has shown that black bears can also be a major predator of moose calves during their first few weeks of life. Then one other major threat to moose is climate change. So climate change um, 
can cause direct stress to moose. Like I said, they're cold adapted, so warm weather can stress them out. Um, but the indirect effects of climate change are probably going to have a larger impact on moose. Um, so warming climate can potentially increase the transmission of those brainworm and liver fluke parasites between deer and moose because deer are restricted, their range is restricted by deep snow in the winter, but as winter's warm and snow is shallower, that's going to allow deer to exist further north into moose range. And that overlap between moose and deer again is going to increase the likelihood that moose can be um, infected by those parasites that deer carry. And climate change is actually also good for those snails that are the intermediate um, host for the parasites because the snails and slugs are active when it's warm outside. Um, a warming climate can also increase the threat posed by winter ticks. Um, so like I said, the female ticks drop off the moose in the spring and lay their eggs and the amount of snow on the ground at that time impacts their survival and the survival of those eggs. And then in the fall, um, when the tick nymphs are looking for a moose to find, um, if it's warmer in the fall, those ticks are going to have a longer time to find a moose to attach to. There are a couple other threats um, that I just wanted to touch on. One is habitat loss or decline of quality. So moose need high quality foraging habitat, which just means places where they can find food um, to have a healthy body condition and to reproduce. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the high quality forage is usually young vegetation, which is found in abundance in recently disturbed areas. And those disturbances might be natural, such as from a timber harvest or, a, or from a wildfire or a windstorm, or they might be human caused, such as from a timber harvest or a prescription burn or something like that. Um, however, the amount of forest disturbance in Minnesota has declined, um, especially timber harvest from peaked in the 1990s and um, fires, which we tend to suppress now. Um, one other threat I wanted to mention is chronic wasting disease or CWD, which is a fatal disease of the brain actually caused by an infectious protein called a prion. So it's similar to mad cow disease, um, but CWD can affect deer, elk, and moose. And CWD was first identified in wild deer in the early 1980s in Colorado, and then was detected in Wisconsin in 2002 and in Minnesota in 2010. So it's been spreading. Um, this map actually shows the current distribution of CWD in North America. So currently in Minnesota, CWD is restricted to deer, and it's mostly found in the southeastern part of Minnesota. Um, however, it has been found at a couple of deer farms further north in the state, so it has the potential to spread um, elsewhere. Only a handful of moose across the world have been documented with CWD, so we don't really know what the impacts might be, um, but CWD is always fatal. Um, so those impacts could be really severe, especially in areas where, again, moose and deer overlap. Okay, so now that we've gotten through all the important background material, I'll just quickly go over some of the work that 1854 does. Um, so as you saw earlier, this map shows the primary moose range in dark gray, which is actually complete within the ceded territory. So this orange line is showing the 1854 ceded territory. And I just want you to take a quick look at this and kind of burn this into your brain because it'll help um, in the next few slides to have some context to some of my maps. All right, so I showed you earlier in the presentation a graph of the estimated northeastern moose population over time, and those estimates come from an annual survey, which is conducted by helicopter. And that survey is led by the Minnesota DNR, but it has included the 1854 Treaty Authority and the Fond du Lac Band as partners since 1995. And 1854 contributes to the cost of the survey and also provides staff for conducting the survey. So that's me down here. I get to be one of the observers for the survey. And this map on the left again shows the primary moose range, which is this gray shaded area in the background. And that's a really large area of northeastern Minnesota, so it can't be surveyed completely every year. 
So what they do for the survey is they've broken it down into these little tiny blocks. And each year, basically, they select a subset of the blocks to survey. And then they sort of estimate the total population from that small number of blocks that's surveyed. And in each block, we just fly straight line transects um, back and forth across the block to determine if there are any moose present, how many there are. Um, and when we spot a moose, like this moose laying here, um, the helicopter circles around the moose to see if there are any moose, any other moose in the group with it. Um, and we record the age and sex of each moose. And we re also record um, if we observe any hair loss that might be from winter ticks. And so the results of the aerial survey are those yearly population estimates that I had shown before. And they're shown again here. Um, these estimates are really important for determining long-term trends in the moose population size, um, for management planning. Um, you can see here after that quick de decline I talked about earlier, um, the population has stabilized since then. So we're at about 3,500 animals or so. Um, and it's going to be really important to continue these aerial surveys into the future. Unfortunately, we weren't able to do the moose survey this year in January due to the COVID pandemic, but plan is to get out there again next year. Um, the aerial survey also provides estimates of the ratio of cows to calves, um, which gives us some information on calf production and survival. So at the time of the survey, which is in January, um, moose calves are about eight months old and they still stick really close to their, their mother. So it's really easy to tell which ones are calves. Um, you can see in this picture, this is a cow moose with her actual, her twin calves following real close behind her. And you can see they're a little bit smaller than she is. So that information is really important to know um, about calf survival. And then the aerial survey also provides information on moose use and abundance in different habitat types. Um, some of the survey blocks are actually flown every year to look at the impacts of fire and timber harvest and other management actions on moose density. Okay, and for the past few years, um, the 1854 Treaty Authority has also participated in what's called the Tribal Moose Collaborative which is an effort led by Grand Portage that includes the Boys Fort Band and also the Keweenaw Bay Indian community in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And as part of that collaborative effort, we also have been surveying the reservations. So we've conducted surveys at the Net Lake and Grand Portage reservations since 2019. And these surveys use a similar method as the State Moose Survey um, with data collected on moose observed while flying transects. You can see here, this is a map of the Net Lake Reservation and the transects are these kind of light colored lines that run east and west. The main difference from these surveys and the state survey is that we actually survey the entire reservation. Um, and the information from these surveys is the same as just sort of an estimate of the number of moose on the reservation. And that information is helpful for on-reservation staff to help um, with planning and, and their research efforts. Another thing that we're involved in is called the Minnesota Moose Habitat Collaborative. Um, so this is a group that has secured funding and implemented some habitat management projects within Moose Range. And these are increased, these are aimed at increasing those areas of high quality forage I was talking about. So treatments might be timber harvest or shearing of vegetation um, or prescribed fire to encourage regeneration of those young plants that are really dense and easy for moose to eat since they're closer to the ground. So this picture in the center shows one of these sites that was recently sheared where all this brushy vegetation was cut down. And in a couple of years, this will grow back up and provide lots of really high quality forage for moose. And we also do on the ground assessments of some of these sites to determine if and how well these treatments are at providing the habitat that moose need. And our goal is to kind of look at what types of treatments and the timing of those and what locations are best for creating high quality moose foraging habitat. And this picture on the right is one of our staff doing an assessment. And you can kind of see this is this shrub layer is grown up about two meters tall now, and that's just about perfect for moose browsing. 
And this map is showing some of those boost habitat sites in these little tiny green dots that hopefully you can see. Um, and just to show some of the data, this, this graph is showing the plant species that we monitor at the sites. Um, these are the sites we visited in 2020, and the red bars indicate how many sites the plant was present at. And you can see that the plant species we monitor were present at most sites, which is good. That means the treatments are providing a variety of browse species. And this is also showing which of those plant species were browsed by moose at those sites, and the, the most highly browsed species were things like mountain maple, red maple, hazel, birch, aspen, sort of things we would expect. Another project um, that we've actually led for the last five years is monitoring parasite prevalence. So we talked a lot about parasite prevalence or parasites before. Um, and if you remember, both brainworm and liver fluke um, White-tailed deer are the primary host and brainworm larvae and liver fluke eggs can be found in deer pellets or deer poop. Um, so previous research has shown that the number of larvae in deer pellets are the highest in the spring. So that's when we go out and collect deer pellet samples. Um, we collect them from on top of the snow to prevent them from being contaminated. And we collect them from at least half a mile apart. So we're collecting them from different deer. And then back at our lab, um, the pellets are analyzed for the presence of these two parasites. And the way the pellets are analyzed, or our process is a little bit different for the two parasites. Um, but in the end, they're viewed through a microscope and we can see the parasites. So at the top here, this shows what it looks like when we find brainworm in a deer pellet sample. So these little tiny kind of pinwheel shaped worms are the brainworm larvae. And this picture at the bottom is showing what the liver fluke eggs look like. Uh, and they're these little kind of gold ovals which stand out because we use this dye to turn the rest of the material in the sample this blue color. So, so far our parasite monitoring has shown pretty high parasite prevalence in deer pellets, um, especially for brainworm. Um, these two maps show where the samples have been collected um, from 2016 to 2019. Um, on the left here is liver fluke. So when there's a colored circle, that means uh, the sample was positive for liver fluke. And on the right is brainworm. So a colored square indicates um, a positive for brainworm. Um, and as you can see, both parasites are pretty fairly widely spread geographically, um, especially brainworm. And this project is ongoing. Um, the pandemic sort of limited our sample collection last year, but we're already collecting samples again this year. Um, and this continued monitoring is going to be really important to determine if future management actions have any impact on these infectious infection rates. So I didn't really have time to go into all the things we do with moose, um, but I did list a few more things here. And I wanted to mention one important way that we are involved is by providing input to other agencies on management actions that might affect moose or might affect the exercise of treaty rights. And that might be anything from timber harvest projects on federal lands to deer population goal setting, um, to input on rules and legislation. We plan to continue all these projects I talked about. And we also have a couple of new projects that we just started um, recently to address some of the newer threats to moose, including CWD and climate change. But I think that's all the time I had. So I will end there. And I just want to say miigwech. Thank you for listening. I'll turn things back over to Marnie if I can. There we go. You're muted, Marnie. Thank you, Morgan. <laughs> I had a couple comments about you having um, biologists having tough stomachs. <laughs> yeah, some of those tick pictures are kind of gross, sorry. <laughs> some of the smells in the office sometimes is pretty rough too. <laughs> True. Oh, that was really cool. It was really cool though. Does, does anybody have any questions for either Marianne and Sarah or Morgan today? or even for Keisha and myself about our organizations. Feel free to uh, drop your question in the chat. I do see 
one question posted earlier on um, regarding moose populations in Portage and Grand Portage. Um, this person wants to know if there's still enough moose in Portage that hunters are likely to get one every year. Do you want to answer that, Marianne? Well, we can both answer it, I guess. My, my opinion is, I think if, if you go out there uh, faithfully um, every weekend and hunt a, a family, you could probably get one every year. Um, the population has gone down. Um, and um, I think it's due to the, um, there's a, what did I say there was? Clearings? Uh, the, the, there's, uh, all the clearings on the reservation have grown up. So it's, it, that I, I personally, I think that's why the moose are, are moving. But I think you, you can get one every year if you put your mind to it and, and go out there all the time. What do you think? Yeah, and there's not, I mean, there's a lot of people, but yeah, not everyone in the community does it. Right. So I think that also impacts your odds because there's uh, fewer people that are doing it every year. Interesting. Uh, we had a couple questions here about bacterial infections killing moose. Specifically, what bacterial infections? Um, as it is a large source of mortality. Yeah, it was, and I didn't really go into detail on that, um, but a lot of the bacterial infections are actually tied to um, injuries of some sort. Some of those were just natural injuries. Some were from wolf attacks where the moose survived the actual attack, but then a wound became infected. And some were from, um, I believe, bulls fighting during the mating season. So sort of a variety of things. and tied to some of those other um, causes we talked about, like predation. Oh, here's a good one. Um, kind of how the biology, the, the, the biology results play into um, bay limits or determining season. How many, how do the studies affect how many moose are allowed to be harvested? And that one is like the answer will be different pertaining to um, which authority, but do uh, you guys want to answer that one? Yeah, so for us, so like I said, we implement the hunt for the Graham Portage and the Boy Sport Bands. Um, there's actually one other band, the Fond du Lac Band in Minnesota, that is um, still allowed to hunt moose in the state. Um, that's it's really a complicated process and it involves a lot of talks with the state. Um, right now, we just have a, a special permit for a set number of moose that our, our band members are allowed to take every year. Um, and it's sort of reassessed every once in a while to determine you know, if the population level um, goes down, if we should decrease the amount of moose. But right now, it's a, it's a pretty limited harvest. Um, the state stopped having a a, a moose hunt for, for state hunters back in 2013 um, when the population sort of decreased really quickly and we stopped our hunt as well for uh, three years. Um, and then once the population sort of stabilized again, we did start um, holding this limited, limited hunt for the bands. Thanks, Morgan. Alexis has a great question here too. What are some of the traditional ways you can use all of the moose? I've heard it of a couple stories from uh, from uh, Boyce Fort, but does anybody else have any input on this? Well, um, the hide uh, uh, can be used for, um, we gave our hide to the Stonebridge singers and they, they made uh, uh, their drum using the hide. Um, I, I don't know what other ways are. That would be one example. Um, I don't know how to process the hide. I don't either. Well, I know you gotta stick it in water for like 10 days or something. I'm not, I'm not sure how they do that. Um, but, but usually, 
Um, and this is on a little side note where the, uh, the parts of the moose, like the tongue, um, when we'd go uh, out moose hunting, um, Bernice Lagarde always told us, and she'd point her finger at us. You get a moose, you make sure you, I get the tongue out of it. So, you know, every time we went out, you know, we, we got, got her the tongue. And of course, we, I like the heart. Uh, um, I use the heart, but other than that, uh, every piece of the moose is used actually. My mom is that way with her whitefish livers. She always says, if you guys are catching whitefish, I get the livers. <laughs> um, let me see. Ben Clark had a question about pesticide usage on, on snails potentially like controlling um, large number of flukes and brainworms. Are there any plans if you know any experimental biology of that happening? I don't know of any. Um, it's actually been studies done to look at what the infection rate of the actual snails is, and it's really, really low. It's actually like 0.5%. So one in 200 snails might have this, this brainworm parasite in them. So that's probably not the best route to go just because a lot of snails aren't infected and we'd be killing lots of snails. And again, we're talking about a really huge area here. Um, it's be really hard, I think, to implement something like that across all of Northeastern Minnesota. Oh, here's a good question. How do you know that a moose is safe to eat? Um, my brother used to check. What did we check? <laughs> we checked all over, and he said, uh, "He said, well, there's nothing wrong with it. It's, it's good, so we can uh, eat it." I can't remember where he checked though. Was it the liver? It was the liver. Then there was something else. When Curtis found had that one moose, what did he say? Remember? I can't remember, but we always put, we always did those kits for 1854. Um, when we shot our moose, we handed in our kits all the time. So there was something wrong. I'm sure. Hopefully, they would, would you have guys told have us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some of those parasites I talked about don't necessarily make a moose unsafe to eat. They don't really affect. Um, the muscle, the meat of the moose. Um, obviously, if you find an animal that's not acting normal, it's probably not a good idea to to eat it. But um, yeah, things like liver fluke don't really make it unsafe to eat. Um, CWD is one thing that could make a moose unsafe to eat. So that hasn't been detected in moose, but it could be someday. And um, when a deer is infected with CWD, the, they don't know enough about it um, to know if it's something that could be passed on to humans. So um, they suggest that deer that are infected aren't eaten. So the same would be true of a moose. In order to keep um, us rolling along, we do have a lot of good questions come in, but I'm wondering if we want to turn it over to Keisha for our prize drawings for the evening. And then if anybody is willing or interested to stick around, don't know if Marianne has a hot date or not, but she could answer some more questions. Just saying, just throwing it out there. <laughs> All right, well, I'm happy to do that. So uh, we do have seven prizes, uh, stuff that was donated from 1854 and from the St. Louis County Historical Society. So I'm going to come over here share my screen here with you and uh, so you should be able to see our lovely wheel of names now all right so i'm just going to pull seven names and then those seven people i will shoot an email to tomorrow and we will work out uh, i'll tell you the list of, of get prizes that we have and it's first come first serve you guys can pick which one of the prizes you're looking for all right so 
right now we're just looking for the names and here we go. Oh, Natalia Walker. You know, and that was really close for uh, is it Myrna, but here we go. William Myers. I always feel bad for the people that it just barely goes past their name. Like that. Amy Elch. All right, we have four more. Is that Crystal Goldman? And Judy Gibbs. One, two, three, four, five. Two more. I get that. I'm strong. Hey. You know that name? All right. All right, here we go. Collective, everybody's holding their breath. Last time. BB Davis. All right. So like I said, for those seven people, I will send you guys an email tomorrow. So watch for that from me, Tasha Soul at the St. Louis County Historical Society. We'll get these prizes to you and then I'm going to turn this back over and ask questions, everybody. Well, see, Marianne did have a date. She slipped out, didn't she? She said not till Friday. It's only Tuesday. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Congratulations, Phoebe. I'm glad that you made it in. I understand there was some trouble trying to get in. Um, do you guys have another minute or two for some questions? Okay. <laughs> Carmen or Eric says, Agatha always wins. <laughs> Lucky. She does. She has the best luck. Yeah. Um, I have one. Let me see here. Oh, good question. Does the moose prion pass to humans by consuming the meat? So the only disease that's caused by a prion is chronic wasting disease. Um, and like I said before, that's not in our moose in Minnesota. Um, it is in deer. And we, we don't know if, if humans can become infected by these prions from a deer or a moose really, um, but it's, suggested that folks don't eat the meat from a CWD infected deer because we don't know. Um, like I said, it's a similar disease to mad cow disease. If you remember, I don't know, 10 years ago when that was sort of big over in Europe and that was able to um, infect people, uh, mad cow disease was and CWD is similar and they just don't know enough about it to know if, if it could pass to people. Good question. Um, we do have a, a few folks commenting and asking about the effects of climate change related to moose and how it might be specifically affecting this and that. Um, Tali asked, with climate change and increasing, with climate change increasing getting hotter, does the tick disease increase as well? Is it is it a relationship as such. 
Yeah, so warmer weather generally is better for winter ticks um, and a, a better winter, a better year for winter ticks just means that there are going to be more of them on the landscape, um, which means that each moose is going to have a higher probability of having a lot of ticks on them. So that's going to be bad for a moose. A lot of other questions asking about transmission between um, these parasites and other animals. Um, not only humans, but like dogs or, um, you know, from eating like deer poop and snails. Yeah, so brainworm and liver fluke, um, I believe, kind of only impact ruminants. Um, so things like deer and moose, and then also things like cows, um, sheep, things like that, I know can get liver fluke. I'm not positive about brainworm. I think brainworm is more specific to like deer, elk, and moose. Um, so it hasn't been shown to affect other like carnivores or dogs or people or anything like that. Uh, I, got a, I got a question for you guys. This might be rude, but that's actually what one of our COs thought when they they heard this, they were scouting during moose season a few years back and um, somebody had taken the testicles of one of the bulls that they harvested from the area and tacked it to the tree. And he was thinking, man, that was kind of crass. Um, but there's a few folks that still remember that is being a sign for how, how you know they've taken the bull from the area. Have you ever heard anything like that up in Portage? Never. <laughs> I think it's <laughs> awful. <laughs> sure. And uh, Morgan, is there any any big picture um, end goal or end game for where we see moose? Like we know climate projections are slated to show um, normal weather patterns that they usually get in Kansas to be up here in northern Minnesota in the future. Is there any prediction whether we think moose is just going to migrate north, if we think that they are just going to go extinct or be extirpated from the area? Any ideas? Yeah, if the climate does warm that much, as some of those predictions say, um, we probably will end up losing moose in Minnesota. Um, they'll probably just shift their range northward. So moose obviously exists in Canada. Um, and they'll probably just get pushed out by these warmer temperatures. Um, like I said, they need boreal forest. They need conifers for shade. And they don't do well in warm climates and shallow snow and areas where there are deer. So if it does warm that much, we're probably going to end up losing moose, yeah. I see one here. How have increased agricultural practices on marginal lands and moose range affected moose populations? Um, that's a good question. It's not something I know a ton about. Um, there's not a lot of agriculture generally in northeastern Minnesota, um, but maybe this person is talking about northwestern Minnesota that does have more agriculture. Um, and I know in areas with more agriculture that generally leads to more deer. And like I said, that can impact moose in lots of ways by these various parasites and other things. Um, but yeah, up, up in the northeast, we don't really deal with too much agriculture and definitely not at a very large scale. So it's probably not going to have a, a really big impact on the scale that we see it up here. Okay. Up in Portage, do you guys have moose that kind of hang out in the same area that you guys name, you know them? Does that make sense? Does that question make sense? No. <laughs> <laughs> Man, last time I talked to you, you were talking about the deer coming to feed at your bird feeder. And yeah. like, that's pretty common, right? And it's, I know that there's like it, right yeah, it's everyday thing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> is there is there a moose that hangs out often around you guys that like community knows, like, oh that's Bob. 
there well, was, there was a moose by a little lake for right. a couple weeks, but I'll, I don't know of anyone naming it. <laughs> okay, um, we did have one question over here for like how far it does an individual moose range? That's what made me think of asking like community related questions, but. Um, on the biology side of things, Morgan, do you know how far one can move? It can vary. Um, I don't have a number off the top of my head, but moose aren't really like territorial. Um, they just kind of hang out. Sometimes they group up in the winter. Um, otherwise, they're mostly kind of solitary and just do their own thing. And I mean, they can wander maybe I don't know, 10, 15 miles is normal. It's really cool when you see, especially like our moose or our wolf maps when we collar them and like how some of the yearling males will just like whoop <laughs> up to Voyagers National Park or whatever, you know, moving around. Yeah, yeah, we don't usually see like really large migrations or dispersals like that in moose. Guys, I think I've covered. Go ahead. We used to see periodically moose in the in the village of uh, the portage. They would come in down in the meadows. Meadows, there has been moose there, and out by Little Lake and the point. Um, even over by the sea store. So there's been moose coming into the community periodically, but. Uh, I don't know, they just, I think they stay, from what, uh, in Portage, you can, um, they would stay a day or two and then they would wander off and go somewhere else. Except that one at the point there, he was there for about four days. Hmm. Well, Morgan and I have a question because you had the one photo and you said, oh, look, these are kid twins, the two that were following mom. So how many, what is the birth rate of, of moose? So how many uh, does a calf have each year or in a lifetime is our twins uncommon? Because all of that's gonna have a, a bearing on, on their population. Right, yeah, that is all really important. Um, so we learn a lot from the, the aerial survey and we also learn a lot from some of these um, other surveys that are done by the DNR and stuff. Um, so they actually do, uh, a urine survey for moose where they follow moose tracks around and collect moose urine to determine how many female moose are pregnant each year um, or what percentage are pregnant each year. And it's pretty consistent in Minnesota that about 85% of adult female moose um, are pregnant each winter and presumably will give birth to one or two calves in the spring. Um, the, the twin rate, that we see during the survey is maybe 10%. Um, it's pretty variable. And like I said, the survey is taking place when the calves are about eight months old. So any calf loss that might've happened before that we, we aren't aware of. Um, but yeah, twins are not uncommon. I think there's a few records of, of triplets out there too. We're gonna have one fan club member keeps, uh, I'm glad she reposted her question. Um, in your maps, it looks like liver fluke and brain worm are more common in moose living at or near the edges of the range, mm -hmm. especially along Lake Superior. Uh, how do you explain that? Is it that a function of where they are able to sample moose or does it have more to do with where moose are overlapping with dense deer populations? Yeah, that's a good question. So I probably didn't make it clear enough, but those maps are actually showing um, brain worm and liver fluke in deer, not in moose. Um, so we can't really tell if a moose is infected when the moose is alive because they don't pass the parasites in their poop. Like I said, the, the parasites can't reproduce in the moose. Um, so we can tell if a deer is infected from the deer pellets and that's what those, those maps were showing. Um, and they were concentrated along like the shore and kind of the edges of moose range because that's right now where we have high concentrations of deer and where we can find pellets. Um, 
some of the deer in Minnesota migrate during the winter. Um, so when there's deep snow inland, a lot of deer migrate down to the shore where there is shallower snow and they kind of yard up. So that's why there's so many deer along the North Shore in the wintertime. Um, and so we do collect a lot of, of deer pellets along the shore and it's harder to find um, deer pellets inland in the winter because there just aren't as many deer that, that stick around for the winter in like the center of Moose Range. Wow. I think we have two more questions unless you guys um, need to jet. Patrick here is wondering if moose are monogamous. Oh no, <laughs> moose are not monogamous. Um, no, most cervids are not. A male moose will try to impregnate as many female moose as he possibly can. <laughs> you made Marianne laugh. Marianne thought that was funny. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and that's why actually that's important. So for our hunt, we usually, well, recently have only been allowing the take of bull moose. Um, and that's because Cow moose are more important sort of for continuing the population. Um, if you remove one bull moose, um, another bull moose can probably come along and impregnate a female. Whereas if you remove a female, you remove all chance of, of that female reproducing. And Marissa, I promised I would get to your question too. Is there any evidence that moose could eventually resist the parasites like the white-tailed deer? Um, it's possible, um, but it would probably take a long time for that to kind of become, you know, a genetically inherent trait in them. Um, not all moose die from brainworms, so some do survive. That might be genetically linked and they might be able to pass that on to their young. Um, but that kind of thing does take a really long time and it's certainly not going to happen in our lifetimes. <laughs> mm -hmm. 